Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 23rd of August. Um, as always, if this is useful, please remember to like, subscribe, comment and share. It really helps people find this video via the YouTube kind of algorithms. New videos this week. Um, I actually created, I think it's like 85 minutes, the MS 900, so the Microsoft 365 Fundamentals exam. Uh, I took it last week and then I created this kind of whiteboard video going over all the core concepts. Think of it as like an exam cram. So maybe I would watch this a couple of hours before taking the exam to kind of get all the various components fresh in my brain. I also did a quick video just on the various Azure VM sizes. There's a lot of different considerations of when we would pick a certain type of VM over another. So I kind of went over them in this video. New this week, so Azure AD has a super new capability in preview. And it's this new restricted option for guests. Now, if I think about what this really is, so ordinarily, I have my Azure AD tenant. This is my Azure AD. Now in there, I have kind of my users. Now those users might be members of various groups. I might have various organizational structure information. So, hey, my manager is that person, etc. And then I can add guests. Now that guest could come from another Azure AD. It could be a Microsoft identity. It could be a Gmail account. It could be a different type of federation. It could be a one-time passcode. But I essentially add them in as kind of a foreign object, a reference and to my Azure AD. Now by default, they're gonna be limited. So limited means I can't just do a dump of the Azure AD tenant and parse everything about it. But what I can do is if I know the UPN, I can get information about the user. I could see what groups they're in. And then I know the group's name now, I could dump out who's in that group. I could look at, well, who's that user's manager? So through not that hard a process, I could really walk through the entire structure of that Azure AD that I'm a guest into. And that's not super popular um, for a lot of organizations. So what I can now actually do, I'll just jump over to the portal. So we have this option now, if I go to my user settings and I go to my manage external collaboration settings, we still have the kind of default users have limited access but I could change it to users have the same as members. Well, now I have this restricted. Essentially, this now gives that user, and I can look at the detailed document. If I turn on this restricted, which is this far right hand column, now really all they can do is read their own properties. And really, that's about it. I can't dump out groups anymore. I can't look at properties of other users. So it's really going to lock down. So if I'm concerned about a guest being able to do things and get information about my tenant, I can now lock this down with this kind of great new capability. So it is preview. So it locks down all those things that I just kind of talked about. Because it's preview, um, the regular Azure portal doesn't yet expose this. I have to go to this special portal I've got linked here and it will expose that restricted option. Now be careful. I might be using certain collaboration tools that expect guests to be able to go and see maybe manager or enumerate groups. So I'd really wanna test this thoroughly to make sure it's not breaking other capabilities I'm leveraging in my tenant. But it's there, I now have this restricted in preview. If you have a test tenant, you can go and try that out. On the Azure Compute side, obviously artificial intelligence, machine learning is everywhere today. So now there's this new NDA100 V4 VM series. Now this is really, the, I, start, I can start with a single virtual machine. It has eight of these NVIDIA Ampere A100 Tensor cores. But I can grow these to massive clusters, the hundreds to thousands. And with that, I can really now create these massive high performing clusters for artificial intelligence. I can scale it using VM scale sets. 
but it's going to give me this ability now for really just this AI at scale is what they talk about. So this new type of virtual machine is going to open up new types of massive AI. And with these new types of tensor cores, there's actually dedicated connectivity between the cores. I think it's like 200 gigabits per second between those various um, cores. So I get massive throughput between them to enable these super clusters. Uh, the DC SV2 is now available in two availability zones in West US 2. So remember, the big thing about the DC is it has that software guard extensions, the SGX. This lets me create secure enclaves that I can run processes. So data is encrypted even while it's being used. Those instructions are encrypted. Now it's in 2AZ, so I can have resiliency from any kind of data center level failure. Ultradisc has been added to Australia East, East Asia, Brazil South, and Canada Central. So remember, Ultradisc is kind of top of the food chain when we think about those managed storage options. Ultradisc can go to massive capacities, massive throughput, massive IOPS. And I can actually tweak those three things individually. I can set the IOPS I need, the throughput I need, the capacity I need. And the performance, I can actually change dynamically. So while the disk is running, I could change it. Maybe I have some big peak job about to run. I need to ramp up its IOPS and throughput. When it's finished, I can ramp those back down so I can kind of optimize my spend. Saying I can't do with regular non-ultra. Normally the IOPS, the throughput, the capacity scale very linearly. Um, Azure Kubernetes service, AKS, they've got this new node image upgrade option. So now I can think about OS updates, the container runtime, I can update independently of having to do a full Kubernetes upgrade, which is what we had to do in the past. Additionally, I can now use ephemeral OS disks. Normally, um, our operating system disk is on some persistent storage. Really, it's a storage account behind the scenes, a uh, page, page block. With these ephemeral OS disks, that OS disk actually lives on the node that's running RVM, what we typically think of as temporary storage. Now, obviously, if I need anything stateful, that's not a good option. But with things like worker nodes, i.e. the VMs that are part of my AKS cluster that then run the pods that run the containers, chances are I don't really care that much about that OS disk. If something happened, I just create a new node. So now I can use that ephemeral OS disk, which is going to give me lower latency to that disk. It will also enable me to provision to scale faster because it's not going and talking to kind of Azure storage. There's also now resource health support. So if you actually go and look at now Kubernetes cluster in the bottom in the navigation, you'll see resource health. It can help me to kind of basic troubleshooting. Let me see basic health information about my Kubernetes cluster. On the networking side, so Azure Data Factory now supports a managed VNet. And why this is kind of a big deal is Azure Data Factory, I kind of think of it as the orchestrator. I might have data coming in from somewhere. I want some process, maybe it's a transformation, and then I send it out to a sync, so source to sync. And Data Factory is kind of that control plane. So now I have all these different types of resource. Maybe I've got Azure Storage, it's probably a data lake. So Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2, which sits on Blob. Maybe I've got some kind of SQL. I've got a bunch of things. And then I've got Azure Data Factory, which really I think about is a control plane. It's orchestrating various activities to get the data, to transform, to put it somewhere. And what we'd like today is private endpoints. Rather than having these all public facing, I want a private endpoint that represents these. And those private endpoints obviously have to live within a virtual network. So now what I can do is there's this uh, Azure integration runtime. The AIP, think of it as the data plane or ADF, it's what goes and talks to the data components. So ADF can now use a managed VNet that it's going to manage, 
I can create managed private endpoints so it will create the private endpoints to my various storage services. So now Data Factory doesn't have to use public access to the various data items, the resources it's working with. It now does all of this work via its data plane in this managed VNet. And I can have private endpoints for the various services I want to use in the same managed VNet. I create them through Azure Data Factory and then just approve them um, through the portal or APIs for the various services. But now it's all on this kind of private data plane. So it's actually a pretty big deal for people that want to control um, how I'm getting to my data sources, how I'm using the data. Uh, I can now do that in preview with Azure Data Factory and that managed VNet. On the storage side, um, soft delete for containers has been expanded to additional regions. Essentially, this is France Central, Canada East, and Canada Central. Remember, the point of soft delete is at a container level, if I delete a container, it doesn't really delete it. It keeps it for a configurable amount of time. Like we do in Windows, you can do undelete. So I think it's between one and 365 days. Seven days is the default. So now if I've deleted it, I can go back and do an undelete operation and bring it back. Just helps protect me if someone does maybe something malicious or accidental. There's no charge for using soft delete per se, but obviously if I've got soft delete turned on, it's not really deleting the data. So I'm going to carry on paying for the data storage until that retention period of the soft delete has elapsed. Um, Azure Databox Disk is now, again, additional regions, uh, South Africa and China. So data box is all part of the idea of sending data offline or receiving data offline. I might have a, a big database on premises. I want to get it to Azure. Maybe I don't have enough bandwidth to send it over the network. Maybe it would take too long. So there's a whole set of data box offerings. Data box disk is the smallest. It's a disk. Um, it's encrypted. But essentially, I get sent that. I copy my data to it and then I send it back to an Azure data center and they bring it into Azure Files, Azure Blob. There's also just Azure Data Box, which is an, an appliance. Um, and then there's even an Azure Data Box Heavy, which is like 770 terabytes of usable space. It's a big thing. But it's all about getting data to Azure offline. So now it's available in additional regions. And NFS3 for premium block blob is also additional regions. That's like, as a whole set, they're not going to go through all of them. Uh, I'll link the details in the notes for things like US East, Central, Australia, Europe, Korea, Canada, all have this now NFS3 preview. So miscellaneous, Azure Advisor. Remember, Azure Advisor is this fantastic capability. It can give me advice around a whole set of different kind of pivots um, of my subscription cost, performance, resiliency, etc. So now it's going to give me right sizing information based on the Azure database offerings. These are these open source based on the community edition um, databases. So Postgres, MySQL, MariaDB. It will now actually go and look at those and say, hey, look, you're underutilized. You could probably change the, the SKU, the size you're using. Likewise, for reserved instance now, there's a lot more resource type things like Cosmos DB, SQL, PaaS, uh, Blob, App Service, MariaDB, Synapse Analytics. It's going to look at the last 30 days. And again, based on my usage, say, look, um, you're probably better off using reserved instance. I say reserved instance, shouldn't use that term. Um, it, it's all about, hey, I'm going to know I'm going to use this amount for a one year or three year term, and you get a saving. So it's now going to give me guidance on that. And the 95th percentile is now available for CPU, memory, and network um, for the last seven days of my kind of my resources. So I can use the uh, resource graph to Azure Advisor, or I can use the Advisor API to get that data. Azure Backup has a whole bunch of changes. So it can now back up HANA databases on Red Hat Enterprise Linux. It's got a whole bunch of new restore options. Um, for example, I could have an unmanaged VM, unmanaged disks, and it can now restore to managed. I can now actually perform those restorations, replacing disks 
even if it has a managed uh, system identity. That's a managed identity usable only by the resource. Um, I can even do a backup restore now of a virtual machine scale set in orchestration mode. So normally with, and when I say orchestration mode, I mean the VM orchestration mode. Normally with a VM scale set, what I have is essentially, I have a gold image. So I have some image, and it's gold, and then I have some configuration that says, hey, I want between three and 10 instances, I have some scale commands, add these extensions, go. And it will then go and create the actual VMs based on the scale set configuration. So what orchestration mode VM means is, this doesn't create the VMs. I actually instead go and create the VMs. And then when I'm creating them, instead of saying, hey, I want to add it to an availability set or an availability zone, I say, hey, I want to add it to a scale set. So now it's kind of part of that scale set in terms of unit of management, but I actually create them independently and then add them into it. So now I can use Azure Backup um, with those VMs who use the VM orchestration mode. There's now an updated Microsoft inter-region set of latency numbers. So this is generated by Microsoft. And what it essentially shows me is, well, what are the latencies on the Azure backbones? These are gonna be consistent. Microsoft had their own massive backbone network. This is the latency. So if I had a VM, in, for example, um, US East, and I was doing an operation to East US 2, I see it's six milliseconds. It's gonna be consistent. So now I can go and look, and this was updated um, end of July. So go and take a look at that if you're curious about what latencies you'll see between resources in different Azure regions. That is not the latency you would see from my office if I was in what I consider US East to US East 2, because I have a latency maybe to my internet provider, then I'm bouncing around the internet so I get to the actual Azure network. If I'm using Express Route, what well, is the latency from me to my meet me, my peering location, and then from that to actually uh, the region. So there's all different things going on. This is something in an Azure region, talking to something in another Azure region, communicating on the Azure Backbone network, like network peering, for example. So that is available to go and see that. And finally, if you're using GitHub Actions, so GitHub Actions, is that really idea of the um, DevOps, where I can create those pipelines, that continuous integration capability. I can go and build things, deploy. So now it actually has a GitHub action to trigger an Azure policy compliance scan. So I can say, well, I've done this deployment. I've deployed these resources. Is it compliant? I can set a certain scope. And then depending on that result, I can either continue with the pipeline or I can fail it. So you can actually go and look at this. It's a new type of action in GitHub Actions. And essentially to use it, it's got an example down here, but I can see it's this Azure slash policy dash compliance dash scan at V0. I give it the scope. It will go and trigger that compliance scan and I'll get the result back and then I can make a decision. So I hope this was useful. Um, as always, uh, comment below. I do watch them. I'll try and answer. And until next week, take care.